Hi, hi everybody. My talk is about Python 3 10 years later. My name is Victor Stiner. I'm a C Python core developer since 2010. Um, what does it mean to work on C Python? It means, for example, to, to maintain the CI, to fix uh, regressions, to take care of the bug tracker, to, to help to review patches, to help to debug some, uh, some issues, but also to take care of the mailing list, to, to answer to questions to follow some peps. Uh, in fact, there are many, many things that, that should be done in Python. Uh, and I'm working for CPython, and, but also on uh, OpenStack for Red Hat. And I'm, I am a very happy uh, Vim on Fedora user. I decided to group my, my slides into four seasons. So the 10 years will be in four seasons. And we will start with autumn. The birth of Python uh, 3000, because at the beginning it was called 3000 and not Python, Python 3, uh, was in 2006 with the, uh, with the PEP called Python 3000. And um, the thing is that uh, at this time, uh, some people started to complain about design issues of the Python language, which were called uh, WARTs. For example, uh, in Python 2, you have the small integer and you have also the large integer. And the idea is that you, if you start with a small integer, depending on the op operation, you may get a small or large integer. So to check the type of a variable, you have to check for both types uh, at once. Uh, there is also um, a new class introduced during the, uh, the development cycle of Python, Python 2, which is called the new class. Uh, you, you get a new class when you in inherit from uh, the object, object type. And um, if you don't generate from an uh, object, you get uh, an oil class. And some features like uh, properties doesn't work as expected on an oil class. So um, having these this two things, like small integer, no, new class, and oil class, can be very confusing for newcomers, because you have to explain why we didn't have the single, single thing at the beginning. There is also a question about uh, division because when you don't, when you start learning a new language like Python, uh, it was surprising to because the division of two integers gives a, an integers and not a floating point number. Uh, maybe if you are used to Python uh, today, it seems um, you understand the reason. But when you start a new language, it, again, it can be confusing. About Unicode, um, I think that Python 2 has a good support of Unicode if you are using Unicode code everywhere in your application, which means that you decode all inputs and you encode that, encode back uh, the outputs. If you only use Unicode everywhere, everything is fine. But uh, if you start using a module which is not compatible with Python, with, uh, sorry, Unicode, um, you, may, you may or you may not get some issues depending on the content of the text. It means that uh, if you only process uh, English, uh, it will be fine. But if you start to get uh, uh, French names with accents, uh, you, you may get a hard uh, Unicode error, which is uh, something quite an annoying, because um, it means that you get the error at runtime, and you don't get the error um, at the first run. So it depends on the content. It can be very annoying. Um, another design issue, I would call, call a design issue of Python 2, is that when you compare uh, two types, which are not, which don't implement the comparison for these two types, there is a fallback in Python 2, where you take the name of the type. For example, if you compare a number and a string, Python will take the name of the type, like int and uh, the string str, and compare the string. And this order may not be the order that you expected. And uh, one, um, one part of the Python philosophy is not to, get, to make a guess of the intent of the developer, but the, um, the philosophy is more to let the developer make the choice. And the last, last uh, issue was the uh, import. In Python 2, you, you may be aware that if you have a, um, a file name with the the same name as a module in the standard library, you, you, you get your local file. For example, if you create sys.py, 
in your project, you, you may get this file instead of the one from the standard library. But um, Guido van Rossum, when he started to design a Python 3, he didn't want to, to break everything. So he wanted to, to control the risk, to reduce the risk of uh, a big fire. Um, for example, we, we decided to not break everything, but really focus on a few known design issues, the Python wars. Um, and uh, there was also an open community, uh, open community process for deciding uh, what to change. Uh, this process is uh, the PEP. So we, we had uh, many PEPs called uh, 3000 and a number to describe the changes on, on, um, made on Python, Python 3. For example, there is a PEP for the, to reorganize the standard library to change all names of the modules. And uh, another um, choice was to not re-implement uh, the, uh, the interpreter from scratch. The, the idea is that um, if you start from the same code base and make uh, changes, you, you get a better backward compatibility, especially for the C API. So it, these are all these uh, rules to reduce the risk. And the last one is to announce um, the end of life of Python 2 to make it very obvious for people that there is a, dead, uh, a deadline. You must be aware that at this time, you will have to, to port your project. And here, here it comes. The holy grail, Python 3. In, in 2008, you get it. We did it. And the first migration plan uh, was very simple. Uh, in fact, Python, Python 3 comes uh, in the standard library. Python 3 comes with a tool called 2 to 3. It supports your Python 2 code to Python 3 at once. And the idea is very simple, is that you run, the, you run this tool on your code base, and you're done. You are compatible with Python 3. Um, maybe it didn't work as expected. <laughs> maybe. Uh, because the thing is that when you port your code to Python 3, uh, the thing is that you drop your, the support of Python 2. Um, and basically, at this time, it means dropping uh, support for all users. Um, so the authors of the modules on the cheese shop decided to, that no, that's a no-go. And um, they didn't want to, to make the change. They didn't want to be the first one to make the change. They didn't want to be the early adopter. Uh, another unexpected issue is that uh, in practice, when you have a code base, sometimes you have external dependencies. And if you don't port all dependencies of your application, uh, even if you port your own code base to Python 3, you, s you are still blocked by the dependencies. So th the problem was that we, is everybody was went, waiting until some, someone moves, and nobody wanted to move. And um, the, the last point is that, um, in fact, we didn't expect that Python 2 was so much popular. We, we did not expect that uh, many companies are very large code bases written in Python, because there is not only the published code, but also the private code written by companies. And it was, um, so it didn't go as expected. Uh, another issue with the Python 3 is what, I, what is called the technical depth. So explain uh, the issue, imagine that you are you have to ask your manager to get some time to work on Python 3. So your manager, why should I let you work on Python 3 support? And the developer, oh, for all these new cool Python 3 features, obviously. OK, but can we use all these features? Uh, well, since we are still uh, stuck at Python 2, we still have to support Python 2? Nope. Uh, so the, the issue with uh, Python 3 is that even if you do all the boring uh, process of the migration, you don't get any new feature of Python 3 because you have to support Python 2. So because of that, it was very difficult to ask your manager to get time, on to, uh, but also to motivate yourself to spend time on that. And um, 
Any, any migration like that means to modify the, the code. And uh, you may know that any tiny change in the code is likely to introduce regressions. So you have to justify not only that you spend time on a useless migration, but also that you are going to introduce bugs. So that's not easy to, to sell to a manager who was customer waiting for the new, new future. Um, another choice to make when you port code to Python 3, uh, when you use 2 to 3, is to decide if you would like to keep the Python 2, base, Python 2 code base unchanged, or if you would like to create um, a single code base, or uh, Python 2 and Python 3 in two different branches, or maybe a two different projects on two different repositories. So some, some project decided to, to really fork to have two different repositories, or at least to have two different branches. And um, to give you an example, there is the DNS Python. I think that this one decided to use two different branches, and, but also to distribute the code with two different names, because you, you was not able to install DNS Python on Python 3, and DNS Python 3 doesn't work on Python 2. For the, some projects, the, the company behind the project didn't want to spend time of Python 3 because of the, of the hairy manager. And um, the community decided to fork the project, like Peel, to create a new project called Pillow. And uh, the first change of Pillow it was to add Python 3 support. Um, another more tricky issue is when the project is uh, made by contributors, uh, like an open source project like MySQL, MySQL Python, but the maintainer doesn't show up. So the, for this case, it was very, very annoying because many people are using MySQL, like uh, many people using Django, but also in my case for OpenStack, it was uh, the SGBD used by OpenStack uh, for my company Red Hat. So not be a, being able to discuss with the database is really blocking. And uh, I think that three different people wrote the world change, uh, world, um, pull request towards MySQL Python to Python 3. But uh, after two years, we, we, are, we still don't have any news from the maintainer. So some people uh, decided to fork the project and to create a new one with the new, the new name. But when you get a new name, you, you may, may have new issue because you have to modify your project to change uh, the import name. And uh, when Python 3 was released, the stable version of Python 2 was uh, Python 2.6. Python 2.6 um, already has some, some uh, things to, to prepare the migration to Python 3. For example, the, there is a bytes type uh, which is uh, an alias to the string type. Uh, there is also the B, pre B prefix to annotate which string are bytes. Uh, but you still need many, many tiny changes in, in, in your code base if you would like to have the same code base for Python 2 and Python 3. So it, um, when you still had to support 2.6, which was uh, the only version available, it was quite, quite difficult to, it, you had to make many, many tiny changes. And you also uh, need uh, backports like unit test 2, uh, but also others to get new features for Python, from Python 3. And uh, on the Python 3 side, up to Python 3.2, uh, there is um, using the u prefix for unicode string was a syntax error. And um, when you had to write code for Python 2 and Python 3 in the same file, not being able to annotate Unicode string was a blocker issue for Python 2. And uh, you, there was a, a trick, uh, which is the U function of the 6 module. And using this function, you, you get a Unicode string. But um, it means that instead of just writing a string, you have to call a function. So it's quite, quite annoying, quite surprising. It's not uh, the, the most straightforward uh, solution. And by the way, the six module uh, is a, a module uh, with many small tools to write uh, same code for working on Python 2 and Python 3. So 
So depending on the Python version, you, you will get, a, it calls the different functions, but you, you, in your code, you only write one function, function call. After autumn come, comes uh, the call, the winter. Uh, it started with uh, Python 3 of shame, shame, shame. Uh, in 2011, someone created uh, this website. Uh, the intent uh, was not really to, to blame people. It, it was more to motivate people to, to start to spend time on Python 3. And uh, you may see that on this picture, that's uh, almost no module of the 2000 uh, most popular module were compatible with Python 3. So in 2011, we started very from, from, from far. And at this time, the, I identified three big, big players on the Python community, three big applications. Uh, there was the Twisted, uh, Twisted Framework, which is a framework to write clients on server network, networking code. Uh, there was also the Mercurial, which is a source control management tool similar to, to Git. Git. And um, uh, Mercurial is fully written in Python. There is also Django, which is nowadays is very famous, but maybe 10 years ago it wasn't. And um, the problem with Twisted is that um, it's only exchange bytes because it's uh, network code. And on the wire, there is no Unicode. On the wire, you only have a flow of bytes. So having to use uh, Unicode as a first citizen class in Python 3 uh, was an issue. And uh, it's the same for Mercurial, because Mercurial doesn't really try to understand all the content of the file. Uh, in Mercurial, the content of the file is basically uh, our bytes. And for the case of Django, uh, I think that uh, Python, when Python 3 was released, at least, the support of Unicode was not, not so good. And because of all the issue of the migration of uh, small wars, of, of small things, more and more people started to complain that oh, maybe um, Python 3 wasn't a good idea. Python 3 doesn't bring anything. Because as I explained, if, even if you port your code, you still don't have access to new features. And um, they also complain of, um, of uh, Unicode. Because when you have a Python 2 application, um, you, you only process uh, text as bytes, and even if you take some two different texts in two different languages in two different encodings, when you combine them, there is no error. In the worst case, you get mojibake, which means that you, you get strange letters, but it's, it's not a new issue because uh, the program will, will not crash with a hard uh, Python exception. So according to them, uh, bytes is the way to go. It's a, it's uh, the best idea to, to store all text. And uh, even worse, uh, the troll uh, started to discuss uh, about uh, an ID called Python 2.8. The, the, the rationale was that since people are still using Python 2 in production, since uh, it, it just works, people are very happy with Python 2. Maybe we should continue the development of Python 2 and just add uh, new features, or maybe at least backport some features from Python 3 to Python 2. Uh, but um, the C Python core developer uh, disagree with that, because the thing is that um, many people are volunteers to work on C Python, and they didn't want to, to have to duplicate the work be between Python 2 and Python 3. So the C Python core developer uh, really didn't want to duplicate the work and really focus on the future and help people to migrate. But uh, s even uh, five years ago, you still uh, you, you, you could st still uh, read something like, uh, I think that people that Python three will will never take off because we only have two two percent of people using Python three. Maybe it was a bad idea, just forget it. But the C Python core developers decided that no, there is no Python 2.8. It's not going to happen. Because we own the language, we are the developer, and we don't want to duplicate the work. It doesn't make sense to go backwards. 
because of the Python warts, the design issues, we wanted to fix uh, all these issues. So uh, PEP was published in uh, 2011, the PEP not found, for our flow. It's a Python 2.8 un unreleased schedule. And uh, if you look uh, differently at numbers, for example, like the top, top 50 uh, most popular project on PyPI, uh, in fact, we are more close to 80% of projects which are compatible with Python 3. So it's not like uh, 2%. And uh, in my opinion, the best thing that we did uh, in the last years was to extend the support for Python 2. The, the idea is to, to, to make it very clear that we are not going to uh, abandon people. We are not going to kill uh, Python 2 users. We really want, wanted to help people to migrate and give time to people to, to migrate, to don't force them to do it right now. Um, so Guido Van Rossum decided to extend the end of life by five years. In fact, it means to double the support time from five years to 10 years, which is the uh, longest support that we, uh, we have in Python. And uh, for your information, uh, the end of life is very, very close now in two years. After the cold winter comes the spring, the flowers, the plants are growing, things are, are changing. So the first very good news is that we fixed our first problem in Python. What is the first problem in Python is how, how can I install something in Python? How can I install a dependency? Um, and the usual answer was, yeah, you just have to install setup tools. OK, but I wanted to install something. I have to install something else. How can I install setup tools? So you have to find an installer on a website to get it on your computer to run it, uh, which means to have the administrator pri privilege, which is maybe not the case. Um, so it was annoying for everybody because it, it was very difficult to install setup tools. It was very difficult to find documentation. And there was not only a setup tools, but also distribute and maybe other competitors. So in 2011, the PIP 1.0 was released. And uh, the, the huge thing was in 2014, the Python 3.7.9 and Python 3.4 uh, now come, comes with um, a new module called Instro PIP. It's not really PIP itself. It's an installer to install PIP. And uh, you fix the bootstrap issue of uh, installing PIP. And the thing is that uh, since it's part of the standard library, people stopped to ask the answer, what is, what is the best option? They just started to use pip because it's, it's part of Python. So slowly it became the de facto installer. And now by, uh, the Linux distribution and uh, the Windows installer, the Mac OS installer, all come with a pip. So you don't have to, to worry about that. And t today it's much, much more easier to install something, in a, to install an external dependency. Um, maybe the first approach of uh, dropping Python 2 was not a good idea. So slowly, uh, a new idea comes up. But you have to understand that um, it takes a lot of time to understand that it was a mistake. It takes time to, to, um, to listen to users, to listen to developers. So it took us a few years to, to, to come up with this new approach. So maybe it seems very simple today to say that, but you have to understand that we, it took us time to, to find this clever idea. Is that instead of promoting two to, two to three, which was not a good idea, um, so to, we should stop to drop Python 2 supports. Maybe a, a better idea is just to add Python 3 supports. And by doing that, uh, a lot of things are changing. Because for example, um, the migration is not a, a single shot. You don't have to port your whole application at once to Python 3. You can do it by small pieces, one by one. You can work on a single directory. You can port a single dependency. And by doing that, you can also check for uh, regression uh, on Python 2 if you have test on a running a CI running to check your code. 
And uh, we started to see new tools like Modernize. This tool is um, takes your Python 2 code and add calls to the six module to make it compatible with Python 3. So you keep the Python 2 support and you get Python 3 support for free. And uh, there is another project that I wrote called Sixer. Uh, this one has a, a different story. Um, I'm working on an open stack. If you don't know OpenStack, it's a giant pile of code, two million lines of code, so it's huge. And um, for OpenStack, I had, I had to start with evangelize Python 3, because even four years ago, people were still not convinced that they have to, to port code to Python 3. So um, when I started to route giant patches using Modernize or other tools, they didn't want even to look at the pull request because it was a giant pull request. And uh, you have to know that uh, in OpenStack, things are moving very, very quickly because it's a huge project with, I think, 2,000 people or more working on the same code base. So if you generate um, a pull request, in a few hours later, you get a conflict. So you have to wait to fix the conflict, and push back, and wait for the new review. And it's, it's not going to, to finish. Uh, for Sixer, I took a different approach. It, instead of making all changes at once, uh, in fact, you can just uh, make a single change, like just add parentheses to print, to make the print um, statement compatible with Python 3. And by doing that, I was able to produce very small uh, pull requests, which are straightforward to review. And uh, with very small pull requests, quickly I was able to run unit tests on uh, Python 3. And now, uh, basically, the whole um, open source project has a unit test working on Python 3. And even today, we have functional tests running on Python 3. So we are very close to our full support. Uh, when you have a very large code base, like OpenStack, uh, you get new issues. Because, for example, uh, in huge companies, uh, the people are moving from one team to another, or quit the company, or leave the project for other reason. It's called the turnover. And uh, when you lose the uh, original authors of the code, it's very difficult to modify a code that you don't understand, especially if you don't have unit tests. So maybe before starting to make changes to add Python 3 support, maybe you, you, you have better time to work on testing your code base just to make sure that you are not breaking anything. Uh, the Dropbox company decided to take, to take another approach, is that um, they wanted to annotate the type, because if you, you are coming from a language like uh, Java, you can, um, the, the type of all function parameters is very explicit, and uh, the benefit of that is that you can run a static analysis to make sure that uh, you pass the right type. So by, by doing that, the, um, you, you, you get a lot of bugs at the compilation time, so you, you make your code better, it works better. Uh, but um, a few years ago, there was no tool. Python 3 just had uh, the ability to annotate type, but uh, on purpose, we decided to not standardize how to, to annotate types, which means that um, you, you can use a string, you can use an expression, you can write whatever you want, but uh, you are not able to use your own uh, custom, custom annotation to validate the code. So what, we, what they did is first to using the, use, uh, with the help of uh, Guido van Rossum and others, they wrote a module called the typing. Typing is a... Um, a standard way to describe annotation, to say that uh, you, uh, to have a list of integers, you have uh, a very uh, specific syntax for that, and uh, there is a different syntax for m more evolved uh, types. So they started to write on a lot of uh, specification for, for all these annotations, and in parallel, uh, a different team w was working on a static analyzer uh, to use this annotation to check that uh, everything is um, everything is working, and uh, the, the the idea for Python 3 is that they they started to annotate type to make sure that the, they don't introduce regressions and to catch 
issues. Uh, another approach to make the migration um, easier is that um, um, the, the, when, when you look at individual changes in Python 3, they are very, very small, like just add parentheses of print, it's not a big deal. But if you look at each individual changes all together, in fact, the, the gap between Python 2 and Python 3 is quite big. So what we, to, we, tr we try to do is to, um, to reduce the gap by building bridge, a bridge between the two versions to make the migration uh, uh, easier. For example, in Python 3, uh, we reintroduced the U prefix. Uh, it was very difficult for the C Python core developer to understand that because uh, we like the purity of the language. We wanted to have a language very, very regular, very simple to learn. And it doesn't make sense to annotate Unicode because everything is already a Unicode string by default. So it took a, a, a few years, so four years after the release of Python 3.0, to accept that, OK, maybe it wasn't the best idea to remove the prefix. Maybe to write a single code base for um, Python 2 and Python 3 using the U prefix. OK, maybe it makes sense, and uh, let's do that. And um, trust me, it was a really big change for me, because before Python 3.3, it was very, very painful to, to annotate 6.u to call the function with a string. Uh, it looks bad. Uh, it was difficult to explain to people why you have to call a function just to to get a string. So it was a, a very good idea. And uh, in 2015, the Python 3.5 introduced, uh, introduced back, in fact, uh, the formatting of bytes. The, this specific change is very useful for projects like Twisted, because Twisted only use bytes for the networking client and servers. And, um, uh, be before this change, to format a string, you have to take your, your bytes, decode your bytes to get Unicode, to process Unicode to format the string, and encode back Unicode to bytes. And um, people like the Twisted developer doesn't understand why you have to decode and encode if you are only on the bytes. Does it make sense to make these two useless uh, changes, operations? because it's also slower to decode and encode than doing the directly the formatting on bytes. So this tiny change um, unblocked the migration of Twisted, for example. At least it was much more easier for them to, to pause the code. And on the Python, uh, Python 2 side, we also made uh, changes to simplify the migration. What we did is to, um, to add warnings. It means that when you enable these warnings, running your code, uh, your Python 2 code, start to complain that mm, maybe this code doesn't look uh, correct in Python 3. Maybe you can look at uh, this code and do something to fix it. And um, the, the good thing with that is that you don't have to wait until all your code base, all your dependencies is ported to Python 3. Python 3. You can start by um, looking at the, all these warnings and uh, to, to, to fix them one by one. So you can see that we, we made changes of both sides to reduce the gap. And uh, another, another thing, which doesn't come from CPython directly, but more from the community, is that uh, more and more people started to backport Python 3 features to Python 2. Because technically, uh, sometimes uh, it was just possible to do it. And uh, by doing that, um, you, can, you can start to use new Python 3 features because uh, they are now available on Python, Python 2. So for example, the enum 3.4 is a new module uh, enum of Python 3.4. So it becomes possible to use new, new features like that. And after the spring comes summertime. It's time to enjoy. So to come back to the previous slides of the Python wall of shame, we only had 9% of the module 
which were compatible with Python 3. And the, the author of the website uh, built this website to motivate people. And one day, he decided to change the name of the website to Python, Python 3 World of Superpower. And uh, today, uh, we are very close to 100% of uh, projects of the 2,000 most popular projects compatible with Python 3. Uh, in, in practice, we, we miss something like uh, 10 projects, but it's not really an issue because uh, these 10 projects are usually deprecated or replaced with a better solution, or a, a new way to fix the issue, or just a, a fork of the project. For example, like MySQL clients is not compatible, but you have MySQL, uh, oh sorry, it was MySQL Python, which is not compatible, but you have MySQL clients, which is compatible. And you have to know that uh, Python 3.6 is now faster than Python 2.7. Uh, here you can see that the green line are smaller. Uh, in fact, the, the, time, the timing is uh, normalized on Python 2. So if, if it's smaller, it means that Python 2 is faster. And uh, this is just the most uh, significant uh, benchmark where uh, the difference is, uh, uh, is the largest. So you can see that uh, on many benchmarks, especially on the Sim SimPy, it's way, way faster, up to two times faster, in fact. To, to give you an idea of the performance um, work that we did, uh, there was a talk of at the previous uh, PyCon US made uh, by uh, Instagram, because Instagram is working hard on uh, porting the, their code base to Python 3 and for different reasons. For example, they, they would like to use AsyncIO, and AsyncIO is only uh, usable on Python 3. But also, Python 3 has less, less bug, it's, it's much better. And they didn't want to, to postpone the technical depth. And uh, the very good uh, feedback from Instagram is that not only they reported the huge code base, because Instagram, for your information, is something like um, 700 million users. So it's a very, very, very large um, product with a lot of users, and it's fully written in Python. So it's not, not a, full, a small thing. And uh, because they have a lot of users, and because Instagram has competitors, they are not able to restart from scratch in a different language or restart from scratch on Python 3. So what they did is to port the code uh, piece by piece, and uh, they succeeded to port the code. So at the end, you can see it on, on the CPU side. CPU, um, in this case, is more UWSGI and Django. On this side, the, they saved 12% uh, of CPU just by moving the code to Python 3. So they, they are using less hardware. And trust me, for Instagram, it, it uh, means something. Because uh, you know, when you have uh, 700 million users, hardware becomes very expensive. But uh, on the memory side, they also saved 30% uh, from the memory. So again, it's very, very, very important for them. And for the memory, the most saving was on the Celery side. To, to, to show you also why you, sh you should uh, move to Python 3, uh, you have to know that uh, I started to collect a list of uh, known bugs of Python 2. Even if I'm working on uh, C Python, and I'm, we, we all want to Python 2 to, to be, to be uh, very stable and to work perfectly, sometimes we are not able to fix bugs uh, because um, I would say that Python 2.7 is super stable because we we have um, a support of uh, 10 years. We have large companies based on Python Python 2. Uh, we we didn't want to break uh, the language. We didn't break want to break uh, applications. So it's, uh, the backward compatibility is even more important in Python 2 than in Python 3. And another issue is also technical because, uh, the, for example, Python 2 supports a lot of legacy uh, platforms, and we don't want to lose uh, this uh, support. 
Uh, we support some multi, multiple uh, threading implementation, uh, while uh, Python 3 only supports uh, pthread and uh, Windows. For all these reasons, it's become very difficult to fix bugs. So to give you an example, Unicode, we, we cannot change Unicode in Python 2. It's just not possible, because people rely on the queue on behavior. Uh, another example is um, the, the Python dict type as a vulnerability um, where you can uh, make a denial of service on a, on a server. When you inject a specific uh, HTTP header, you are able to crash the server with a very small payload. And um, one um, countermeasure for that is to randomize the hash function because the attacker is not, no, no longer able to generate a specific pattern to crash the dict type. But in Python 2, we, we were not able to enable the, the protection by default, again, because of the backward compatibility. Um, and the sub-process mo module is not thread safe. Maybe you are, you are not aware of that, but uh, when you start to get such issue, it's very painful because um, you may know that multi-threading is not something deterministic. It depends on the timing of the sub-process, so you may or you may not get the crash. It's very difficult to, to find the relationship between the multi-threading or the crash, and uh, we cannot fix that. Uh, the recursive lock is not signal safe. A signal is, for example, when you spawn a sub-process and the sub-process completes, you get back a notification with a unique signal, and when you get a signal, um, if you get it on the bad moments, uh, the recursive lock may be become inconsistent. So it's also a very annoying issue because you don't, you are not able to expect signals. You cannot control signals, so it's very, it's very painful. And the last issue is that um, even if you modify your code to use monotonic lock to avoid issue with the winter and the summer time, the DST change when you add or remove one hour. Uh, even if you make your code safe, uh, Python um, in internals still use the system clock, which has the issue. But on the bright side of Python 3, uh, we fixed the issue like um, we added the time time dot monotonic uh, clock, which is now available on all platforms. Um, another more tricky change is that so the file descriptor has no in non-inheritable. It means that when you spawn a process using fork uh, on exec or sub-process, you, you don't inherit the files that, that are open in the parent process. Because um, uh, in Python 2, if you open a, a file and, and uh, spawn a process, even if you close your file in the parent, and if it's still open in the shell process, uh, the file is not closed technically in the Linux kernel. So the data may not be flushed. You may not be able to remove the file on Windows. Uh, you have a lot of uh, very uh, annoying issues uh, because of that. And uh, something more cri critical is that if you open a sensitive file, like a file with passwords or, or sensitive um, critical uh, information, if you inherit the file descriptor, the child process technically is able to read this file or even to write into this file. So we decided to make it make them non-inheritable by default, to just to fix the issue for everyone, and you don't have to modify your application for that. Um, another change of uh, backward incompatible un change is that in Python 3.5, we um, we changed how we handle signals uh, because previously you you was able to 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 get an exception in Python when your function is interrupted. But uh, when, when um, you get it, you have to restart manually your function until you get no signal. And we decided to make it uh, at the C level so you don't have to worry about that anymore. And um, about the file, file descriptor non heritable I wrote the pep and it took something like eight, year, eight months to convince uh, Guido Van Rosson. And uh, what he said is that uh, we are aware of the code breakage this is likely to cause, and doing it anyway is for the good of the mind. 
Uh, to give you an idea of uh, Python 3, we, we have not less than 21 new models, like the very famous AsyncIO for asyn asynchronous programming, the new Enum, the popular Parslib module for file names, but also the very cool uh, unit, unit test.mock to mock uh, functions to write more easily tests. Uh, in, since Python 3.6, you have the amazing uh, f-string. Uh, if you are not coming from Python, uh, it seems very stupid that it's a new thing, but it took us a lot of years to, to, uh, to say that, okay, it was maybe a good idea to support that. You, it's a new way to form a string. You, there is no percent, uh, percent operator or dot format function. It's just f string, and the string is formatted in place. You can pass a variable, but you can also pass. Um, you can technically, it's a Python statement, so you can call method. You can uh, write operation. Uh, we we added a lot of things to the language itself, to the Python language uh, for asynchronous programming for asyncio. So the, the we first we added the yield from, which delegates a generator. Uh, from another subgenerator, uh, the async and await keywords were added to make the asynchronous code look more straightforward, more simple. And we we also added support for um, asynchronous generators and uh, asynchronous um, comprehensions. The, there are way way more new Python free um, new features, uh, new syntaxes like uh, keywords only um, arguments like the print function, which now take arguments, like file on end. Uh, you can use star on double star to unpack list on dictionary, which is really cool. And uh, a very small uh, thing, but which is again obvious, is that now you are allowed to write underscore to make numbers, literals more readable. You can annotate the type of a variable. Uh, you can write multiple uh, with um, Context manager statement on the single line. Uh, we get the new matrix uh, multiplication, which is uh, something very, very useful uh, when you use uh, NumPy. So with all these changes and the successful migration, uh, now the question is, uh, is it time to bury uh, Python 2? Um, in fact, uh, people already started to do it, like uh, Fedora 2023. Uh, and uh, the latest version of uh, Ubuntu already has no Python 2 in the base system. Uh, in, in this case, it means that if you pull, um, a, install a Python 2 application, you still pull Python 2. But in the base system, there is no Python 2. And you have to know that uh, Ubuntu and Fedora are very keen of uh, Python. A lot of things are, are written in Python. So it means that we already did uh, most of the work. There is Python 3 statement, which, uh, which is a combined um, timeline of all scientific projects to show when the Python 3 support will be dropped. Uh, they would like to coordinate to make it clear that you, you have to start working on Python 3. Uh, the Python, cl Python clock is a, a countdown until uh, the death of, of Python 2. And um, last year, um, two big players of the Python which are IPython 6 and Django 2, decided to drop Python 3 support. So um, I think it's a, it's a huge thing for Python because Django is very, very popular. And the thing, the, the thing that uh, even Django with large code bases, a lot of dependencies, is able to move to Python 3 means something. Uh, imp means something. Okay, I think we are done. <laughs> no, ser seriously, for Python 4, um, you have to, to the, the, we learned from our mistake. We understood that it was not the best way to migrate from Python 2 to Python 3. And um, we, we will do it very, very differently. I think that Python 4 will be as a GTK 4 and other project, it, it will be just no, just the next release, not a backward incompatible release as was Python 3. 
We will use exactly the same deprecation process uh, that we are using between each minor pattern free release, like 3.4, 3.5, 3.6. So it means that we start to deprecate, generate warnings, and only the release after, or sometimes two releases later, we start to remove the code. So we, we are giving more time to people to pause their code, but also to communicate on our changes, on documentation, but also on the code itself. Thank you.